So I'll just start with the update. I uh, want to welcome all of the new participants. We are, our membership is up to 121 individuals. And that's this May at the kickoff meeting, we had about 45 people on our mailing list. So had some great opportunities to interact with people that are working around social coupling. And um, there's still a lot of energy around this topic. So some of the, the places I've been able to interact engage with individuals working on um, coastal coupling is um, I attended the NOAA, the NOAA Water Initiative meeting, uh, and I'm sure several people on the line were there, but that gave me an opportunity to work with the service delivery and decision support team so that we can have a more holistic view of what it means to do coastal coupling. So not just integrating with the modelers, but taking this full, taking it to more of a full picture um, that starts with gathering stakeholder requirements and moves all the way to delivering products so people can use the work that people in this community do to help decision support in the community. And um, if you want any more information on that meeting, there will be a summary coming out shortly, which I'll be happy to share. I also participated in the Coastal Ocean Modeling Test Bed annual meeting. And um, this is uh, it was an update of the work done on the IU COMT project. Uh, they also had several presentations on data management, data integration, web-based model validation to access, cloud computing, and we talked a bit about how, how we can transition the models that the academics are developing into operations. And uh, if, you, if you'd like any more information on those, I can also put you in contact with the presenters. I don't have a formal summary of that meeting yet either, but I'm happy to send it out once I have one. And then last month, uh, we had a, an excellent presence at the, the 2019 AGU fall meeting. I hosted a town hall um, on Monday around lunchtime. We had about 42 people in the room. And this session gave us an opportunity to hear from panelists on different perspectives on social coupling, and it allowed for us to have a conversation with the audience about where interests lie and how to better engage. So uh, there is a link to the summary in this PowerPoint, and I will send that out as a separate document after this, so you can get a better idea of what all this discussed. And in that meeting, we also need to let the world get us feedback about topics individuals were interested in and how they wanted to engage and things like that. And so I'm going to use that information as well as what we collect in webinars to help plan future meetings. Uh, we also had a, a session on continental scale modeling near the end of the week at HBU. There were about 70 presentations uh, where there were three oral sessions and one quite large poster session. These sessions were extremely well attended, even though they were at the end of the week. Uh, during the presentations on the Friday, there were at least 100 people in the room at all times. So it was a great turnout for that. We hope to have a bigger, a bigger presence next year at the AGU uh, fall meeting, especially since uh, more of the oceanographers will be able to go this next year. Um, and then ocean sciences coming up in just a few weeks, we have an oral session and a poster session. So if you are at Ocean Sciences, please come join us and check out some of the work that work we've been doing. Um, so does anyone online have any questions about that before we move on to our presentation for the day? Look in the chat to see if it would be possible to share the presentation posters. Um, I'm not 100% sure if we can share all of those, but I will talk with some of the presenters and see if we can get that information out there to you all. Thank you for that comment. Okay, so I don't see any other comments coming in. So with that, I will turn it over to Katrina to give us an update on the National Bathymetric Source Project. All right, great. Let me share my screen. Looks like uh, I can't share it while you're sharing. So, okay, let me thank you. Thank you. There we go. 
Uh, all right, can everybody see uh, the screen and hear me okay? Yes, looks great. Looks good, okay. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Katrina Wiley. I am part of Coast Survey. I'm in the Hydrographic Surveys Division. I'm the National Bathymetric Source Production Lead. Uh, I work with Glenn Rice, who is the Development Lead. So NOAA's Coast Survey, um, MBS, National Bathymetric Source, I'm gonna call it MBS, sorry, that's what it stands for, um, project, it exists to create and maintain a high resolution surface of the best available bathymetry to support charting. So the merge process that we're using to combine this bathymetry primarily evaluates hydrographic quality metrics and the product that we drive carries over the source metadata. Um, we make a seamless surface. It's high resolution bathymetric surface. It's in S102 format. So it lets us, um, it enables the creation of nautical charts, but it also provides a foundational product that supports modeling, exploration, industry, science, regulation, and the public in general. So hopefully this is something that is of use to modelers and others on the line. Um, it is my first coastal coupling community of practice. So um, I'm excited to be here and thanks for the opportunity to present about what we're working on. So bathymetry compilation. So Coast Survey is the keeper of the national bathymetry. Um, the bathymetry is on the chart and the actual source right now is on the chart. So it's derived for navigation from there. So it's anytime you have a new source, you're actually compiling it cartographically and it's kept there. So that middle image kind of shows all the different sources for New York. So what the NBS, what the National Bathymetric Source Project does is enables a move from this product driven workflow to a data driven workflow. And one of the reasons we're doing that is for charting, that's one of our primary missions that we're solving is, um, or helping to solve, is that historically the charts were created to support local commerce, local navigation. You can kind of see on the left that there are many scales and they're irregular shapes and sizes. And what Marine Chart Division is trying to do is go to a rescheme and recompilation effort. So there's a very large effort underway right now to go to the image on the right, which is a standardized um, uh, chart scheme and going from the different, like smaller scale to larger scale, you need that source bathymetry. So what the National Bathymetric Source Project does, and here's an example of, of the uh, band five cells, so this is a four meter grid of New York, is it, it has the high resolution surface of the bathymetry to support this next generation of charts. So instead of having all the bathymetry compiled to the chart and kept on a product base, we're, we're bringing it to the source level. So anytime we have new source, we can add it to this best source of bathymetry. So this is data driven. So here's an example in New York again, these are all the data sources uh, on the left and then the data product is on the right. So the idea here is when, when you have a new source of bathymetry, it goes um, in at the source level, not at the product level. So a new a grid is being created every time there's new source and it's being updated um, in that manner. We're also working, um, especially on Glenn's side, on the development side to automate this process so that uh, we've got a lot of Python scripts um, to automatically scrape known sources of bathymetry. So anytime like the Army Corps surveys, we can grab that data, ingest it, do what we need to do, and then get to the product. So what this looks like, here's a, a workflow. Um, on the left would be our sources. So we've got, of course, our NOAA sources. We also have Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, they survey a lot. They do all the, like, the channel frameworks of the, uh, in the US. We have USGS data. We have different university sources, other sources, all this external bathymetric data. So we're working on ingesting this um, into kind of a prepared source data. So that, what does that mean? It has the common reference frame and it's got required metadata populated. So we know how to combine it. So when we get to our tile database. This is where we've done the combine based on the best quality of the data. And we're working on a common datum and we've got um, restricted source control, that means licensure. So if something is sensitive or, or not for public use, we keep that um, license tag. So we make sure we don't uh, give it to the public if they're not supposed to know about it, um, but that we do use it for like charting and modeling um, as appropriate. And then this bathymetry extraction layer, this is the, what would be interesting uh, or of interest to you guys is that when we have these different uh, clients, uh, right now our main client or, or customer is charting. So we are 
creating products specifically for nautical charts, but this bathymetry extraction layer lets us be as flexible as, our, as people need. So within NOAA, external to NOAA, to the public, um, we can do a format translation, we can do a datum transformation, we could resample it to whatever desired resolution that um, the customer might want. Um, so this is, um, the plan is to go not only to charting, but to precision navigation and modeling and agencies and to the public. So this might not be for everyone. Um, not everyone is within NOAA, but for those of you who are listening who are within NOAA, this is kind of how we're thinking about it. So before data might have gone directly to the Marine Chart Division, we're hoping to rework uh, this workflow. So all the data would go to the Hydrographic Surveys Division, then to the, Na the National Bathymetric Service, this database of source, and that would feed our charts, response, precision navigation, modeling agencies. It would be that one source of best bathymetry. And the workflow for how this would go, we would have um, a pre-process stage, and then we go into ingest, qualify, amalgamate, or combine, confirm, and distribute. So the first step of pre-process is actually very labor intensive, especially for our hydrographic surveys division branches. Uh, what they're doing is, um, oh, sorry, I'll stay on this slide, is they're, they have to look at all the survey data and we wanna make sure that it has the correct metadata and that there's no flyers or, or um, bad data points. You know, maybe there was fish and in the previous grading algorithms that fish was um, not caught and removed. So it's still in the grid. So our, our branches, our hydrographic branches in um, Seattle and Norfolk are going through all of the bags, the bathymetric attributed grids. So it's just a standard format for bathymetry. And they're reviewing, reviewing them for flyers. And they're populating the appropriate metadata. And they're making sure that the datums are correct and that, you know, if it's an image that it's opening up in the correct georeference um, location. So this is a very big effort, um, but this is kind of before MBS does its, um, does its work. This is the pre-process step. And the source of data that's coming in is not only NOAA and CEI data, so National Centers for Environmental Information, but also eHydro is a major source of um, data coming in. This is all Army Corps. Uh, eHydro is a ArcGIS um, platform that we can scrape automatically and pull down new surveys. Some of these districts are surveying once a day. Um, they're, they're very quick to post the data and um, each district has its own uh, metadata format and how they're surveying. So we're working with each district individually, but we have scrapers for each one that can pull this data down. Um, we're also pulling in LIDAR data. Um, we're working on scrapers for um, both Jabal Text as well as other sources of LIDAR. And the, the goal here is to have all the data be publicly available. So we don't want to say, oh, okay, the source of that data is so-and-so's email <laughs> or so-and-so's shoebox, you know, under their, their desk. We really want to get to the point where um, the data that we're including in MBS is uh, available and accessible and in open formats and standard formats that we can automatically pull from. So like I was saying for the pre-process, this is a big effort, um, making sure there's no flyers, that the data is clean, the metadata is correct, and that the all the data that we're pulling is machine readable. Um, all the all the development that the Glenn is Glenn Rice is leading is in Python, and we're using Git. So the plan is to publish all the code, um, not only for internal uses, but also for other hydrographic offices um, in other countries who, who might be able to, to use some of this to, to do the same thing. So here's our uh, Sam Greenaway stool of hydrography. So when you're collecting bathymetric data, you have to know three things. You have to know how deep is it, how well do we know it, and who do we blame when th something goes wrong. So um, without those three things, your little stool of hydrography falls down. So when we talk about how deep is it, we're talking about what datum is it in and what are the units. We have to make sure we know that. Um, how well do we know it? Uh, for this project, we're using quality of bathymetry. Um, so S101, so that's, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but that's, you know, did you detect features? Um, did you get complete coverage? What's your uncertainty in the vertical and horizontal? 
And then who provided the data? So this goes back to who do you blame? Not that we would blame anybody, but who do you go contact if something is wrong? So understanding when the data was surveyed, um, who surveyed, who collected it, and what's the license for use? So is it um, for the public or, or do we have to um, keep it on a separate, more sensitive database that does not go to the public? So when we're, now that how the data has been reviewed and it's got the appropriate metadata, part of our ingest on the workflow is to do this datum transformation. And so currently we're using vDatum, um, although I will say, especially in the near shore, there are areas of vDatum where um, it doesn't extend all the way in. So we're, we're working on um, alternate solutions for that to make sure that we have an appropriate separation model uh, to do this step. So we take the source datum, we use vDatum to get to our working datum, which is NAD83 mean low water. And then again, based on the, the person who needs this or what's gonna be in the bathymetry extraction layer, we'll use vDatum again to transform it out to something different that might be needed. Uh, da, da, da. And then, so we have everything on a common datum. We have the appropriate metadata. The next step is to combine the bathymetry. So we are doing this supersession or this combine based on quality. So these are very um, hydrographic as well as cartographic terms that are thrown around in the international um, uh, arena. So this is quality of bathymetry for coverage, detection of features and uncertainty. So the picture on the left, what you're seeing there in gray scale is side scan mosaic and then the colorful image is bathymetry. So sometimes when our field units go out, they're collecting both bathymetry and side scan, um, like on when you see both. And so they're actually getting coverage. They're not getting full bathymetric coverage, but they are scanning for feature detection. So we're doing an interpolation as part of this um, where we have both bathymetry and side scan sonar data. But then you see in the middle where there's just set line spacing of bathymetry, that's different. We don't have the side scan to support feature detection. So that has a lower quality um, than where we would have set line spacing with side scan. So we are looking at coverage. And so we're, we're signing, you know, is it full coverage? Yes or no? Is it full bathymetric coverage? Yes or no? Feature detection, this one's hard. So this is are you capable um, in this survey of detecting and reporting on features um, of significant size? So significant size kind of ties back to, to hydrographic needs. So are you finding like the one meter cubes or two meter cube features in, in less than 40 meters and 5% of the water depth in greater than 40 meters? So this is important, especially for charting um, because this kind of tells the mariner like for the quality of the data here like yes we looked for features and you know we didn't just cut out all the rocks because we thought they were flyers but we actually spent time looking and reporting on features so don't worry you you likely won't hit anything um, so that's a really big indication of, of quality and then uncertainty so this is the the vertical and horizontal uncertainty of the data um, for our NOAA field units we have a really good handle on this in terms of you know total propagated uncertainty models and um, what equipment we're using to get to our horizontal uncertainty. Uh, it's a more of a challenge for our external source um, data sets coming in because uh, you have to understand uh, the equipment and how it's integrated and um, appropriately estimate um, vertical uncertainty for that data set. So the external source data team is being led up by James Miller and he's doing a great job of putting some processes in place to get to these answers for our external source data. So again, I just want to reiterate, uh, a lot of people will go around and combine bathymetry. What makes the National Bathymetric Source Project different is that we are doing this based on quality of data. So we're taking into account coverage, detection of features, and uncertainty to make that, that decision on, on where you do have more than one source in, um, per node, which, what is the best source? What's the highest quality source? And, and we're taking that one step further in, in terms of um, spatial and temporal changeability. So if you look on the picture on the left, that's an inlet, that's Hatter's inlet. So a survey might have um, varying levels of changeability, even within its survey, just the survey outline itself. So you might have like very changeable areas near shore and then not as changeable in the deeper water. So we're trying to take that into account 
instead of doing like, um, you know, just one level of quality for the entire survey, the, the project is working on a node by node basis um, so that you can, can actually do that analysis based on your geographic location. And how we're getting to this changeability, um, we're, we're working with the Office of Coast Survey's hydrographic health team to, to use the model that they are currently applying for decay. So they take into account um, number of storms. Um, gosh, that's, I think, uh, affecting a sandy bottom less than 40 meters. And they look at tidal currents. And then they also look at anthropogenic debris. So like um, the little circles you see in there on the right are areas where there's, you know, obstructions or uh, position of proximate obstructions, like things where people are dropping things off boats or boats are sinking um, as an impact to decay or changeability. The model's flexible, so it can add additional things, like we want to add in um, like a shoreline changeability factor uh, that can come into play and potentially is something for like channels where you have dredging, like extreme events um, that will also improve the kind of um, decay coefficients that we're looking at. So we give a survey, a source save a survey, a quality score, and then we decay it, and then we combine on that decayed score. And then when we get the result, the, um, because this uh, is a new process, it's kind of a new process, but we still have a chart to compare against. So what we're doing is we're looking against the chart to make sure we didn't miss any source. So if there's like a shoal sounding somewhere and we didn't have it in our product, we have to understand where that source is coming from. And um, if we don't have it, we want to include it. And if it's not winning or if it's not the, you know, the, in our result, our product, we have to understand the supersession and why. Sometimes the chart is just a first in, first out process, and sometimes we might be missing a source. So right now we're kind of bootstrapping this process for quality control. Um, the image you see here is for LA Long Beach in California. Uh, so you've got the sources and the bathymetry. If you look really close, you can see um, tiles, grid tiles. That's the new re-scheme band six cells. Um, so those are at two meter that Marine Chart Division is um, working on uh, producing uh, HD charts for. Uh, LA Long Beach is also part of precision navigation. So, you know, advancing needs for, um, you know, knowing your data with what uncertainty and, you know, increasing delivery rates, mariners are asking for this. And so the IHO, the International Hydrographic Organization came up with this S100 world. And if you look on the bottom left, uh, bathymetry, this S102, is part of that world for precision navigation. So we are feeding precision navigation um, bathymetry. And uh, the image on the right is just showing kind of how that would be used in the real world. This is an example in Norway, where instead of just a chart with some soundings, you're actually getting like a 3D uh, model of the, the high resolution bathymetric surface. So for LA Long Beach, um, we are also going to be updating the, the current precision navigation product um, in this area um, with this result here. This is just a, one of the MBS databases we have up right now. So for our build out, um, again, our, our main customer right now is charting. So we are working with the Marine Chart, div div marine chart um, Division's uh, processing branches. And so if you look at PBC in orange, that's where we started. And we hope to deliver that in March of this year. So if you look on the image on the right, those are their new re-scheme cells. So you've got the band four and band five. Band five is four meters, those are the bigger red cells. And band four, sorry, I switched that. Band five are four meters, those are the smaller orange cells. And then band four are the eight meters, those are the larger, larger red cells. So we're gonna be delivering these tiles to them. Um, we've already delivered kind of test tiles in New York and we're kind of building out uh, the rest of it. So March is our deadline for that. And we're also doing precision navigation. So you saw LA Long Beach, that's also, um, we're reviewing that now. We hope to deliver that uh, very soon as well. Um, March is our deadline for that. We also have precision navigation in New York and Mississippi River. Mississippi is a little bit tougher because of the separation datums, understanding the, you know, when you go from mean little water to, to river datum. 
and making sure that it's supported somewhere, either in VDATUM or some other way, um, like PROJ, where we can get to that separation model. Um, so yeah, we're in PBC now, we're moving to PBG, that's the Gulf next, and then we plan on coming up the coast, so PBB and then PBE, so Florida and then uh, Mid-Atlantic. Uh, we're following the Marine Chart Division's rescheming process. This is kind of what's driving our, um, our next steps. And we continue, um, you know, our next steps are also to continue to build our process and refine our process to automate as much as we can to work on that distribution with different um, customers who might want specific, um, you know, datums resolutions. We're also hoping to do a variable resolution instead of these set of single resolutions and continue to engage with others who are doing um, similar things, but uh, different combining process. So, you know, GMRT, CBIT 2030, other countries um, that are all working to combine mathematry. Uh, we continue to engage and try to make sure we're all speaking the same language with this, this metadata. So with that, I just wanna say thank you. Feel free at any time to reach out to Glenn or myself and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Katrina. That was a great presentation. Um, let me switch back to my screen real quick. Yeah, that, that is fascinating work. I, I really appreciate it. So you said March, we're going to have um, the first bit of this information available? Yeah, so March is going to be New England, so from New York up through Maine. And in March, that's going to be available online, or should we reach out to you all, uh, you and Glenn, to, to get more information? So we're, we're working on our distribution for like a public, you know, dissemination. Um, so you can reach out to me or Glenn directly. Uh, I don't, we're hoping to have it online as well, but we'll likely have like an FTP set up. Um, if we don't have it finalized in terms of our distribution. It might just be like a, a service um, by March and then we kind of can refine it from there. That's still in Great. development. Okay, well, we'll definitely keep in touch. Um, if anyone on the line has uh, questions for Katrina, if you could type them into the poll everywhere, um, we'll give them about 10 minutes for questions. Um, if we don't get to everything, I'll, I'll follow up with Katrina and Glenn afterward and make sure that we answer all questions. Uh, so there was a, uh, let's see, the great work and talk and what's your email. So I will, I will make sure to share that information with everyone after the call. Great. And I, I will, I'll send my slides to you as well. So if anyone wants them, they can have them. Perfect. Uh, we actually have a, a question here in the room. Go ahead, so, please. Uh, I'm not sure if I missed it or not. Uh, today, is it in the plan to use uh, um, OpenStreetMap or Esri database as, as, as well or not? Okay, did you hear that? No, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? I... Uh, is it in your plan to use the um, available data from other sources such as OpenStreetMap? or ESRI, PSRI, data? Yeah, we're hoping to use all available bathymetry sources. So um, uh, ESRI is usually grabbing kind of their background from NCEI or, or from others. So we are, um, I think I heard that question right. So w if we have access to the bathymetry and we're able to get it, we, we hope to use it. Right now we're, we're bringing in NCEI with imagery sources, Army Corps, and we're working on LIDAR right now for Jobble Techs and another remote sensing division. So, you, so are you scraping this web or no? Just to talk to them and uh, have an arrangement to access their data? For ESRI? We, for other sources, yeah. Oh, other sources. Yeah, no, we're working with them and we're scraping their sources directly. Um, we're making sure that when we do our metadata, we have both um, the source and product because sometimes that external source data goes through our hydrographic surveys division and they might, you know, grade it at a different um, resolution or they might clean some flyers out. So we kind of have the source metadata as well as the product metadata. And then the external source team will post that bag back to NCEI and we'll pull the bag from there. So, um, 
Yes, we, we are. Project, really. Big project, really. Big project and very much needed. Thank you. Yeah, it's a big project. It's it's a lot. We're trying to do it as automated as possible because there are a lot of data sources and it's it's definitely needed. We're we're hearing that from a lot of people, not just for charting, but in general. Right. Right. So there's a, a few questions online. Uh, the first one is how far upstream on rivers and streams and how far overland do you plan on extending the topography? Yeah. I'm assuming some of that depends on what data is actually available. Yeah, so we, um, for upstream on rivers and streams, that's a good one. Right now, we are constrained to V-datum. Um, we're we're kind of working with, um, I know Jack Riley has a bunch of ideas on uh, separation models that might not be in V-datum yet that we could potentially use as just like the separation model itself. So anywhere we have data. So a lot of Army Corps districts will go upstream. And as long as we understand like, what the local river datum is or, or what the local datum is and we have a way to get there, um, we will use it. Um, but right now, today, we are at the V datum extents. Um, as for how far overland, um, Glenn and I have talked about this quite a bit. I think, um, I don't, we're not, we're trimming it for Marine Chart Division because they don't want topo, they don't care. But in terms of the data that we're pulling in, we're not trimming it. So I think we're planning on going like 20 meters inland. Um, because we can we understand that you know modeling um, that that near shore interface is really important from land to water. And also for, for inundation uh, and high tide flooding, they're kind of more of a problem because going getting the uh, demo is really important for those problems. Yep. So we're working on scraping grid. We are pulling from grid directly. And so those those are kind of in work right now. Um, we also likely pull from digital coast. Um, if, if we don't have all the sources we need from grid. But yeah, absolutely. That's it's very important data. Um, so the next question was, uh, when you say you're sharing your code, is that the web scraping code or the code you use to process the data after it's collected or both? Yeah, so that's a great question. So right now, everything is done on Python except for the combined process. We're using Keras right now. Um, we hope to um, make that our own and have it open source as well, but we have not done that development yet. But the intent is to share everything um, on Git. And um, so that that should be everything. Um, we just haven't finished that combined process. And some of our review is still manual because we haven't um, coded up all the different checks that we want to do. But we are we're big proponents of open source and, and sharing. And there was a question in the chat. Um, what's your timeline for the Gulf region? Yeah, sorry, I, I think I answered the my email until instead of the answer to that one. Sorry. Uh, um, so that's starting next. So our our big, we're hoping to do that in fiscal year 2020. The big push is going to be that pre-process for the hydrographic branches to work through the flyers, especially in the Gulf, because a lot of that is set line spacing, where you've got like skunk stripe we call it so like set lines of bathymetry with side scan in between it and you tend to have a lot of flyers on the outside edge so assuming that we can get through those surveys um we hope to have all the tools in place that the, the rest of it's easy um so but we are planning for this year end of this year uh is, is our timeline for gulf coast excellent um we have a couple more minutes we'll try and get through So I know Jobble Text, I think they just posted a lot of New England. There was a, a lot of collection in Northeast um, this past year. And I think it was all getting posted in December. So I need to confirm with the team that we're pulling that. But um, yes, and just to clarify, like we're, in, we're pulling it all, but our product is not a product of sources. It's the final combined product. So we're only going to like um, have the, the best bathymetry uh, in that final product. It'll have the source to go back, you know, to the Jabotex survey or whatever, um, but it's actually the kind of the benefit of this is to do all that quality determination for what's the best quality of symmetry available and, and provide that. Okay, 
Um, but yes, we, we are working to grab all the Jabal texts. Sometimes there's overlapping surveys and you know, the newer data will, will kind of win over the older data. So you'll only see the newer one in the, the final product. Um, and so unfortunately we um, have to move on to the next presentation. So the, the rest of those questions, I will follow up with uh, Katrina afterward and get answers back. But, Please feel free if you have any other questions, anyone online or anyone who's in the room, if you have additional questions for Katrina and Lynn Ryan, let me know and I will make sure all those get answered. Thank you again for your great talk. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you all. And I appreciate the questions. I'll definitely get back to, to all of you. Okay, great. So um, with that, I would like to switch to our next presentation. Doug Graham will be speaking to us about NOAA's continually updated shoreline product, also known as the CUP. Um, Doug, would you like to go ahead and share your screen? Doug, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Okay. I cannot see your screen quite yet. There we go. You see it now? Mm -hmm. Great. So let me get it in uh, presentation mode. Okay. Are we good? I think so. Looks okay. Good. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Kayla, and thank you, Katrina. Um, as Katrina does the bathymetry, our aspect is support nautical charting for the shoreline and, along, and longshore features and hatches and navigation as well. So we share a little bit of responsibility there. So why is shoreline important? These are the things, topics that I'd like to discuss. Um, why does it not have a well-defined shore uh, measurement? And um, why do we have another NOAA shoreline? Uh, what are the sources? Who are the users? And how do you get it? So 40% of the population lives on the coastal counties, which make up 10% of the land mass, which impacts our economy. Here's a view at night taken in 2012 showing uh, the population distribution, much of which is along the coast. And also the majority of the uh, imports and exports by value are carried by uh, marine transportation. In 2012, we had a social economic study done, um, and our primary purpose, again, is uh, support nautical charting for safe navigation. Um, but there's also many other uses for shoreline data. So the 10 most costly U.S. natural disasters, uh, seven are coastal. And of those seven, six have happened in the last 14 years. So why uh, does shoreline not have a well-defined length? Um, many times I get questions, what is the length of the shoreline for a particular state or um, county or whatever? And we have to refer to uh, the Coastlines of the United States document published in 1975. Um, these values were derived from a multi-scale uh, nautical charts measured by hand, um, and the total length at that time was 95,000 miles. If we extrapolate cusp, we get more in the order of over 300,000 miles. So it all depends on the scale and level of detail that you're measuring. Here's an example <clears throat> of a 1 to 40,000 chart on the left and 1 to 200,000 on the right, showing the level of detail in the, um, what you would be measuring. Um, here we have a one to a thousand on the left image uh, compiled and one to 24,000, which is our standard national shoreline scale. And there is about a 6% difference in the length of shoreline uh, just based on scale alone. 
So why do we have another Noah shoreline? Um, because of that question, why, you know, what shoreline do I use? The uh, Noah shoreline website was developed uh, many years ago, explaining various different shorelines. On that list, um, there's seven that are NOAA's shoreline, and it all depends on the, the user and the application. There's no continuous shoreline that exists that includes uh, attribution, a reference to a title datum that is maintained regularly and is up to date. And CUSP is attempting to meet uh, that need. So the timing is right for CUSP. If we did it earlier, we wouldn't have um, the capability to produce it that we can today. So it is the most current shoreline represent representation. It's reference to the mean high water datum or applicable. Um, it is attributed, including horizontal accuracy, the attribute of the feature and the date. Um, it is a continuous shoreline. It's frequently updated. Whenever we update it, we post uh, the updates on the application. Um, there's various remote sensing technologies that are available that we use for, for CUSP. And there's uh, NOAA and non-NOAA sources that we use uh, for a source that wasn't available 20 years ago. So it's the right timing uh, fulfills a um, desire to have a consistent federal continuous shoreline. For example, USGS is using it in their NHD shoreline. It goes with the uh, map once used many times, which implements an interagency objective to use existing data. Uh, it's much more um, data available and there's a increase of multiple data sets that you can cross reference to uh, have some validation of accuracies, horizontal accuracies of the data. So CUSP started in fiscal year uh, 2012. And since then, it, it produces about the same amount of compilation that our standard national shoreline uh, compilation does um, with about one fifth the resources. So why, um, what are the sources of CUSP? The primary source is the national shoreline that we have been producing. Uh, it's done with um, photogrammetric uh, soft copy means uh, where the compiler will wear 3D um, stereo glasses and compile features and attribute it. And the imagery is within tide tolerances. We also recently had the Tipovathy LIDAR data sets with high resolution uh, shoreline that's contoured out and then it is attributed in that previous slide using uh, imagery. We have available um, high resolution satellite imagery um, that includes uh, multispectral, uh, it includes the uh, near IR, and if we can get an image taken uh, near high water, uh, we could use that with automatic feature extraction. And we also have orthorectified imagery that we can stream in our uh, uh, in arc map when we compile in mono. Um, and if we need to improve the accuracy, we can download the imagery and uh, do so with horizontal control. Um, Here's an example of automatic feature extraction with our imagery using Imagine uh, image segmentation. We've also used various other software packages such as Envy, uh, RDS, and Quantum. And we found that none of them excelled in all situations. It really depend on the, the imagery that we're working with. And then once we get that imagery like LiDAR, we'll put it into, uh, uh, once we get that vector, we put it into imagery and then we'll attribute it and verify the, the vectors. Um, we also can download LiDAR data and run it through the VData model, which is uh, similar to what we do in-house, and then uh, contour align and then attribute it as we mentioned. The availability of LiDAR data uh, from Digital Coast. So not all LiDAR data is suitable for extracting shoreline, but there is 
a large amount of uh, LIDAR data available along the coast. And the most recent version of VDATUM is uh, 4.0.1, where we can take uh, ellipsoidal elevations from um, GPS and then convert it to a, a mean high water elevation where we can contour out of a line for mean high water. And here's a case where we took uh, data from um, another federal agency and worked, created a tin and download and contoured out a mean high water line, which we would clean up and verify with imagery. And right now, the uh, extent of LIDAR that we have in CUSP is much of our outer coast, where it does very well in sandy areas and uh, rocky areas, natural rocky areas. It does less well in apparent shorelines like marsh areas or cultural areas like ports. Um, CUSP has... Um, there's uh, 11 cus uh, fields, and of which six of them are required, including the date of the source and the attribute of the feature and the horizontal accuracy. These are a subset of the 200 plus um, attributes within the national shoreline. So it, it just includes shoreline. So elements of cusp. Um, the technology dictates the scale. So unlike the Nas National Shoreline where we do uh, one to 24,000 or larger, if there's a larger scale chart, um, there's, no, or very, there's no generalization of the shoreline. So if the LIDAR produces a one to 1,000 scale, uh, we will keep that in cusp. But if we have to do it manually uh, for imagery, uh, we will compile it one to 10,000 because of the efficiency. And then uh, we have used IFSAR in Alaska, uh, supporting about a one to 10,000 scale. So we strive towards a 20 meter or better horizontal uncertainty. Uh, this meets the IHO hydrographic surveys minimum standards for all shoreline except where areas under keel clearance is critical. So it's the majority of the shoreline, um, it meets the, the horizontal accuracy. And the question of how far upstream we go, right now the guidelines are, are 10 miles from where it turns from mean high water to stream. And many areas we don't have a good guide, so we're using the National Wetlands Inventory um, as that guide if we do not have uh, tide water, tide stations. Um, the attribution is consistent with the National Wetlands Inventory, so we look at that when we're determining marsh. Um, it's not always the case because there is generalization in the National Wetlands Inventory, um, but we do use it as a guide and, and generally consistent with it. And then CUSP is uh, a polyline that is topologically structured, so there's no all shoots off of it. It's, it would be a continuous line or poly, poly line. So there are differences between a national shoreline and cusp. Um, the national shoreline is going to be more accurately, tidally uh, referenced, and it's done typically in stereo, not always, but typically. Um, and the water levels will be described in the report. While cusp, it does a, a best um, estimate of the mean high water based on the available imagery or um, vertical modeling or using the uh, shoreline indicators. And the focus of uh, nautical, is, focus of national shoreline is for nautical charting. So it's gonna focus on ports and approaches and has less emphasis on say marsh areas or areas that are used for um, recreational uh, activity. Well, CUSP is, is focused on uh, all shoreline equally. So where the national shoreline does not produce shoreline, the CUSP will try to fill in. There's a greater generalization of non-navigational significant areas in marsh and in the national shoreline where CUSP is going to try to get the detail of marsh and have connectivity. 
of water areas. Um, National shoreline is generally at one to 24,000 scale, or if there's a larger scale chart or inset, it will uh, match that. While the scales of cusp vary uh, from anywhere from one to a thousand, which is reference to the um, technology used to create the shoreline to one to 24,000, which is generally the national shoreline. The national shoreline um, has discrete geographic areas and dates. It may have different dates within of that survey, but it was the, the dates that were to acquire that particular survey. For example, there, there might be a different date in the mean low water and the mean high water, but it is a, a geographic area, which I'll show you an example. Um, while Cuspis is just a continuous multi-temporal uh, shoreline. Uh, Cusp includes uh, only shoreline, while the national shoreline includes other uh, themes, such as aids navigation, hazards, uh, cultural areas, buildings, and, and so forth. There's three or more stages in a national shoreline, while CUSP is typically one, and there's a documented report with any project in a national shoreline, while CUSP does not have that report. Here we're talking about the discrete area of a project for the national shoreline on the left. So the green indicates the project that was selected. So in the bottom, if you do a selection of projects, you'll get a list and uh, the green one is the uh, top one that was selected. The outer blue line is the project area. So all the uh, area within that project was viewed in stereo um, for generally in stereo uh, to see if it matches the existing ENC shoreline. Where it does not, they'll add shoreline, which is the inner box. Um, not all projects are like this. Um, many projects where the outer box will have complete shoreline, while CUSP is the continuous uh, shoreline. But it does draw out uh, a problem with their application. For example, on the far right of the right image, there's a missing shoreline. The shoreline's not actually missing, but it's not being displayed in the application because the map tiles are not being updated. And it's a problem with, uh, it's a known problem, but um, it's a problem that we have with our application. So since 2012, 60% or 62% of the shoreline is uh, represented by CUSP. Majority of that is still aerial photography, but satellite imagery is increasing uh, rapidly as well as LIDAR. Um, we also have a breakdown by uh, NOAA collaborative regions and states. So the states with uh, the most, or I should say the regions with the most shoreline are um, the Great Lakes, West Coast, and North Atlantic, but the least is Alaska and the Pacific Islands. And here's a image of the average age of cusp shoreline. So there's generally, the average age is about 10 years old. So who are the users? Um, the public is the, the major users that access the application, but we don't know who they are. But we have a better idea of the government, education, and commercial. So NOAA would be uh, a primary user, and other government agencies include the Army, US, uh, the uh, USGS, the California State, and USDA. And for education, they are a major use, but they don't access the application often. But the top ones are Hawaii, Southern California, Alaska, and BIMS. So um, direct uses of CUSP within NOAA, uh, we have it used for provisional navigation charts. Um, we have it used for environmental sensitivity index. And each of these examples is CUSP shoreline, an example. We support VDATUM. And we support the global self-consistent hierarchy, high resolution geography data base. And we also support uh, sea surface temple uh, temperature modeling. So where, how do you get cost? Where do you get it? It's through the NOAA Shoreline Data Explorer application. Um, and the different layers, we describe the CUSP National Shoreline, but also includes raster T-sheets and planned shoreline. You can uh, download CUSP by rectangle or by region. And when you uh, 
do it by rectangle, you can select uh, shapefile or KML as the output. Or uh, for larger regions, it's best to go uh, to preload it uh, zip files for the regions, and these are updated on a quarterly basis. And I thank you for the privilege of your time. Um, I do want to mention that in February 20th, we're going to have a town hall style webinar uh, on the NOAA Shoreline uh, Data Explorer application. So if any of you are interested, we'd like to hear your input on how to access data and the data itself. And there's my contact information. Um, if you wouldn't mind providing a copy of that presentation so I can send it out to the group and I can make sure to, um, to send that information about the webinar for the town hall so you can join that as well. Sure will. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that. Can you get a moment? Can you stop sharing so I can put my screen back up? Yes. Can I share my screen for a minute? Sure. Let me stop sharing mine so you can. You should be able to share now. And so, do you guys? Um, yeah, I think you should be able to see this now. Yes, I can. So what we did is uh, we downloaded Cusp, and that that was that's been an amazing resource. And so what we're doing is upgrading the SDOS model to about from 200 meter resolution to about 20 meters of resolution. And so um, obviously we, we started out with US medium shoreline database and uh, there was a huge mismatch between the, uh, especially the LIDAR based DM and, the, um, and that shoreline. So that gave us no end of trouble. So we downloaded CUSP and, uh, but because it's not, comprehensive. Uh, we actually melded it with the uh, NHD database. And so we, we took segments of NHD, put them together with CUSP, and where we didn't have any other data, we had US medium shoreline data. So in particularly when there's dynamic inlets, and uh, I think uh, Doug mentioned that the, let's say the average age is about 10 years old or so. Um, what we did, and you can see that over in here where CUSP is actually a little bit off from the actual uh, um, LIDAR data in terms of where it migrated to. So what we did is we segmented things. Uh, we're in, especially, because we're really interested in inlets and the exchanges there, we updated that. And um, we found that NHD was, was really pretty darn good. And we're going far, far upstream uh, to beyond the tidal range. NHD was really great for the upland stream networks. And again, U.S. medium shoreline was pretty bad. And, and I think the, the graphics that I have uh, show that nicely. So the, uh, the final product that we came up with, um, and again, we're just in it for the, to have a continuous shoreline along the entire U.S. East Coast and Gulf Coast and Puerto Rico for the meshing that we're doing. Um, we updated it and we got 
a product that in most places is fairly tight uh, relative to mean high, high water, which is what we're interested in. And so that product then together with all the, the topo bathy databases and uh, um, uh, Katrina obviously has an incredibly powerful product that they're producing, but we just used uh, all the available databases, including the, the uh, dredge channel database from the core in the Java tech. Uh, we then uh, are meshing the entire US and Gulf Coast with that with automated meshing software up to about the 10 meter contour. And so here's an example of, of a, a portion of an East Coast mesh and, um, and zooming in on the, uh, the uh, Southeastern United States over there, you can see the kind of unstructured meshes that we're automatically generating. Again, a meshing cycle, once we have all the data in place, takes about a half a day or a day to generate this kind of unstructured mesh. And so what we're obviously really interested in here is uh, the, uh, the coupling aspect. So we're really interested in that whole dendritic uh, channel uh, network and trying not to waste too many nodes. So we have very flexible um, meshing schemes that only use the minimum amount of resolution that we think we need identifying uh, the, uh, the bathymetric features, but also especially that shoreline. So for us, that, that shoreline is, is the, the most sacred and we really adhere to it tightly. And here you can see um, a little segment of that mesh along the South Carolina coast. And then going in, this is the mesh that supports that. And this is all automatically done. And, and you can see we go extend quite far out into dredge channels that uh, go into the, uh, onto, extend out onto the inner shelf. And, and this is the land side. And, and those are made mesh separately and kind of mated uh, together. And, and zooming in a little bit further, again, you can see that we continue to zoom and, and resolve that, uh, that dendritic uh, uh, channel network down about 30 meters. Again, supplying and supporting that with the resolution that, that's needed to identify that critical feature. Um, we've begged, borrowed, and stolen a lot from uh, uh, all the shape and uh, volumetric type software for graphics that's out there. And, and, and again, we, we made all those and, and get down to that. So you can well imagine that uh, the uh, shoreline is everything for us. So CUSP has been incredibly helpful. It was a lot of work though, melding it all together. So that's a quick little overview how we're using CUSP. And, and having a finalized database along all the US waters would be amazing. That's very cool. Thank you so much, Johanna. This shows how these tools are really valuable and then just combining them with all the other sources that are out there. Uh, there's already a lot of work that's been done. And um, if anyone has questions or would like to learn more about what Johannes is doing, I think um, you're free to reach out to him and get some more information. And um, would you also care to send me those slides when you Sure, absolutely. Great. So, Johannes, is so Doug. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Johannes, is this Doug? Um, are you creating then any shoreline or using shoreline that meets the 20 meter accuracy that you're finding for your modeling? Are we creating it, you asked? Yeah, or creating it, or as you say, you're pulling it from different um, sources. So, we're, we're, for 99.9%, .9 we're pulling from cost. And then next is NHD, and then uh, where, where there's just no other available data, uh, we're using U.S. Medium Shoreline, okay. and, and so we're melding all those together, which which again was was a lot of work. But then in critical inlets, uh, and we're really interested also in jetty systems, yes. uh, because uh, often the jetty system is a large part of the throat into the back bay, right. and therefore a lot of the dissipation occurs there. Um, and when there's a jetty system or a particular the uh, dynamic inlet, we will go in and uh, if uh, cusp and NH NHD don't match the different segments re relative to their availability, we'll go in and go ahead and change them by hand. Okay. Um, you could notify us of an area that you're working in and we could make sure it is updated if you're talking a few inlets. Sure. And, and I'm maybe talking about 40 or 50 inlets or something. Yeah. Yeah. Because they, they change, as you say, they change quite frankly. Um, 
but also if you find another source of shoreline that's better than the cusp that you think should be in cusp, uh, please let us know. Sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and I can't tell you how nice cusp has been. I mean, it's um, U.S. medium shoreline was, you know, essentially horrific if you're going to use a, a lighter bathytopa database. Uh, one, one problem that we have had because uh, we're going up to about 10 or 15 meter contour, depending because we are doing the, co the coastal floodplain, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, is uh, that uh, when when the data runs out in the available databases that we have, uh, we uh, we tend to have a really hard time in matching some of the uh, the global databases that are available, and right. which tend to be biased quite a bit high. So we've had had some issues with that. Understandable. Thank you. Doug and Johannes, I'm, I'm not seeing any questions online. Um, so if you have them in the future, let me know and I'll make sure to get those answered. But thank you guys both for your great presentation. Well, thank you. So um, if I can get my slides to advance. There we go. Okay, so um, after those great talks, I want to get uh, the community's feedback on on this webinar series um, and just what what you think about them. Um, uh, the first question I pose to you is: this was, um, How frequently would you like these webinars to be held? Obviously, some of that depends on availability of speakers and um, balancing, you know, everybody's valuable time with topics they want to hear, but I'd like to hear back from the community on, is this something you want to have once a month, every other month, quarterly? Um, so I'll give you a few minutes to, to share your feedback on that. So I will say that initially we had planned to have these about every other month, but there was some uh, conflict and schedule, uh, scheduling and availability of speakers. So we'll do our best to keep it um, as often as we can have good talks that are worth your time. So I've seen our response every month. more responses come in right now. So um, I'll, I'll switch to the next question that um, uh, what would you like the topics to be that we discuss? Like I said, we want to have a balance of information, but not overloading their schedules. Um, some of these topics that we have considered having in the future are collecting stakeholder requirements. I know at our kickoff meeting, that was something that people thought was really important to, to gather the requirements, but the question of how to do it is somewhat challenging. Um, another topic that had been brought up that might be of interest is the use of AI, of artificial intelligence, in our modeling projects going forward. I've got a couple people that would be interested to speak on that. But I'm open to anything that the community will find valuable. The data availability. Um, so some of that the symmetry stuff we discussed today, but other types of data um, would be good to get an idea of who had that information, and then just regular updates on on those projects. Those are good ideas. Anything else? Right. 
Well, I will um, post this poll to other um, after the webinar. So you can continue to, to think on that and um, give me your feedback in the coming weeks. So there's one for water model, national water model code to cover different parts of their model components. Like I was saying, to see where the water model is going and where things are going to be updated. A physics informed AI, that's great to see. I already have some speakers lined up for that in the future. Vertical referencing the model, definitely important. Okay, well, for the sake of time, I'm uh, going to go ahead and move on, but continue um, giving me your feedback as you come up with things you'd like to, to hear. Okay, so um, the last thing I want to talk to you guys about is where our future engagements as the host to Pathline Community of Practice are going to be that I'm aware of. Um, so the next opportunity we will have to engage is at the Ocean Sciences meeting in San Diego. Uh, we have a session on the coast of modeling, modeling, uh, one oral session, one poster session on Wednesday afternoon. If you're at Ocean Sciences, please come see us. Uh, in late March, we hope to have another webinar. Um, I intend to have this discussion around gathering model requirements, but that, that could change depending on speaker availability as well as the interest of the community. Uh, we will have our second, uh, second annual Coastal Public Community of Practice meeting uh, here at the National Water Center in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, May 12th and 13th. If there's anyone that would like to schedule additional time for some technical discussions or just getting together with different scientists to talk about more technical aspects, please let me know and I'm happy to help you with reserving meeting spaces and organizing that. So this is 12th, 13th or Tuesday and Wednesday. We could schedule some time on the Monday prior or the Thursday after, but please let me know and I'm happy to help with that. And then we're hoping to continue this webinar series. Um, I have put by monthly, but this can change based on what the community is interested in. And of course, we are looking for speakers and looking for topics. If you would like to volunteer to, to speak on one of these, I would really appreciate it. Please let me know. Uh, and finally, I have managed to secure a website domain and I have begun populating it. So hopefully, Prior to the May meeting, I will have uh, that website available with all the documents from our engagement online. So all the presentations will be up there, the summaries for meetings, things of that sort. So um, I'll just leave this poll up. If you, anyone has additional feedback on this webinar or future engagements or anything else for that matter, I'll leave this up for a while. Please feel free to put that in. And um, with that, I want to thank everybody for their time to attend this. I want to give a special thanks to Katrina and Doug, as well as Johannes, for pre presenting for us. Um, and as I said, I'll send around all the materials from this call and any other information after this. So look forward to hearing from you all, and uh, thank you again for your time.